standing in the back. We need back in, we need medical. We're gonna need SWAT, we're gonna have that. Down here. Get that. Let those guys in. Yeah. Do the officer, you need SWAT down here, full gear. Steven. Do the officer, go ahead and come back again. Here. This is Johnny. Yeah. The shank went into ten. I went into the situation that I'm going to have to kill the guy. I'm not going to just hurt him. I'm not going to stab him two times and say, yeah, we're even. You know, because the philosophy in prison is, you know, you stab me, I kill you. I just stabbed the shit out of him, you know, until he didn't move anymore. The reason I said Troy Kell was one of the most dangerous people I've ever met is because Troy Kell, when you meet him and when you see him in a, in a certain environment, is a very uh, charming, charismatic, intelligent individual who certainly by no means looks like somebody who could commit a crime as heinous as he committed in this case. I've seen guys hesitate on not thinking something was serious, and it was serious, and they get themselves stabbed up or they get themselves fucked off. They get themselves killed. All the white supremacists were going, say hi to Troy, make sure, you know, say hi, let Troy know that I said hi. And they were given the power, the white power symbol. Oh, sure. So. Well, they like to yeah. mention that, too, because yeah. they want the status that's associated with him and his crime. Because they're looking to Troy, you know, he's, a, he's our inmate god, and we're going to do anything we can to gain status with him, because then that protects us within the institution. So they hold his shanks, they hold his brew, any contraband that he has, and he very subtly manipulates everything, and then to the administration, he wants to represent this clean image. Well, I'm not doing anything. You know, I'm not associated with these guys, but he still has his soldiers going out and performing these acts. Well, that's a good cleanup for them. I mean, they have to say that to really justify doing that to me. I mean, keeping me in the hole, restricting my movements, uh, making sure that that there's no real freedom for me to have, and maybe I'm not entitled to that. I mean, it's perspective of the individual. You know, some individuals think that, you know, he shouldn't have anything. Give him some bread and water and put him in a cage somewhere. And that's, that's fine, too. But don't expect the, the guy to be a nice guy and smile and to say thank you for the bread and water every time you bring it. You know, it's a double standard. They, they expect you to suck ass regardless of, of what they're running their face about. You suck ass long enough, pretty soon you start choking on shit. My personality now has, is be reflectant from how I was raised in, in the penitentiary. It desensitizes you. You don't have the human interaction, the contact, understanding or anything. It's structured that everybody's a piece of shit. You shouldn't respect anybody. It's kind of like, you know, just, it, it doesn't matter. You have to realize why Troy Kell went to prison. And that 
being uh, at, at 18 years old, he concocts a scheme with a couple of his friends to take a young man he's never met before in his life, a young man named Cotton Kelly, uh, take him out in the desert, take out a gun, Troy Kell takes out a gun and shoots him six times at close range in the face, killing him. After the killing, takes his wallet and they go buy a convenience store and buy liquor. This guy, I felt, was taking advantage of a friend of mine, and she asked for my help. And I went kind of overboard. Me and a friend of mine from high school agreed to beat this guy up because he was doing some things to some teenage girls that we knew. She was a friend of mine. She was like a, a sister kind of to me. I met Cotton Kelly at Circus Circus eight months prior to this actual tragedy. He ran some type of um, adult entertainment business. He wanted me to pose nude for him. He had started following me and calling my house constantly, harassing my family. And as a 15-year-old child, I made a very bad decision, a very immature request, and I called upon Troy to beat the man up, to leave, have him leave me alone. I was raised in Las Vegas, Nevada, in a middle-class family. I'm the only child. I think I was probably just an ordinary kid. Huh? On the blog, I wasn't any different or anything from anybody else that I noticed. <laughs> Troy's been a part of our life um, ever since I first came to Las Vegas, um, since I was probably like six years old. Um, we lived on one corner of the street, and on the opposite street, he lived at the other corner. And um, me and a couple of friends, two little girlfriends, were walking down the street, and him and his little friends were sitting in front of his house on their bicycles, and, you know, they were watching us, googly-eyed, because he's three years older than me. So when we got all the way to the end of the street, towards the desert, you know, we turned around and said something real sassy, and they chased us on their bikes, and we ran, and he jumped off his bike and tackled me in the grass, and, you know, it just became like a plaything. And ever since then, he was like, you're going to be my girlfriend, and I said, no, I don't even like boys. Well, Troy used to come over to our house when he was like seven years old, play with Sandy and Shane in the backyard, or go swimming. Um, he was one of the neighborhood kids. Good kid. My father's into horses and kind of a redneck background, country boy kind of thing, and we had horses and stuff. I was expected to be successful. You know, my family, you know, they're not losers. His father was really, really strict. And um, I remember one time on his birthday, we were, uh, he, I think he was turning 13, and I believe I was 10. And I rode my bike all the way to the mall, and I bought him a Nike outfit. And he had to sneak out in his backyard and climb up on the brick wall for me to give him his gift because um, he was on restriction. He was always on restriction, just and for absolutely nothing. His father must have been very tough on him, very abusive, I believe, with him. And his mother um, was never around. I know they were separated, but I don't think his mother came around too much. I don't know if it was because of the father or what, you know, but uh, I guess he looked at me more like a mother figure, you know, because he's always sent me, even till this day, he sends me a bouquet of Mother's Day flowers. My parents got divorced and I kind of bounced back and forth between them. It was kind of a struggle for me for a while, but it's nothing out of the ordinary that any other kid goes through. I hung out with the stoners, and I also hung out with my jock friends because I like to, I like to play sports, but I like to drink beer and smoke a couple of joints on the weekend too. I went to school, but I didn't like school too much—the authoritarian kind of structure of 
were telling you to go here and do this, and I rebelled against that, dropped out of school, started getting in trouble after that. The story goes like this. Shaw and two of her friends allegedly lure the Canadian man out here to the desert. We're north of the city. Shaw then allegedly gets out of her car, goes to the bathroom, and on the way back, falls down. They had me pretend that my leg was hurt, and I guess this was a plan that they had um, conjured up. The Canadian man got out of the car to help Shaw. man grabbed my arm to help me. Um, that's when the first gunshot went off. For a reason that I can't really understand, uh, I decided to bring a gun and, and shoot the man and kill him. I didn't go to sleep that night. Running away? Yes, of course. <laughs> but why did I? I don't know. I didn't have anywhere to run to. You know, I couldn't just keep on running and running. Police say this desert landscape near Rancho and Durango was the stage of a grisly show and tell this past week. Police say the three suspects spent a week going back and forth here in the desert showing off the body to their friends. Then one of the small children who had seen the battered corpse got to feeling guilty and told police. Las Vegas uh, Metropolitan Police Department called me at work at midnight uh, and told me that they had Sandy downtown on a homicide, and I thought, oh my God, she hasn't gone through this again. When I was 13 years old, I was spending the night at a friend's house, and her stepfather went into a jealous rage and shot and killed her mother and her mother's two friends and then killed himself. It changed my life. I detached myself from my emotions. Um, I didn't have a sense of life or death. It was just all the same to me. Another episode happened to her. She's walking home from school, uh, sees this guy come running up behind her, girl in front of her, sees the guy shoot the girl in the back of the head. She's already gone through this. Now this is two. How many times? I mean, I'm 48 years old. I've never seen anyone in my lifetime get shot. I mean, what are the odds? So I went down and <laughs> I find out that she's the one being charged with it. I can't tell y'all <laughs> how bad that hurt. <laughs> to know my daughter was involved and a man's life had been taken. <laughs> It became known as the show and tell murder. Right. How did it get that name? The girl was in high school at the time, and I was, and I had already dropped out of school. Uh, she had some girlfriends from school that, that she knew, uh, that they both knew the man prior, and, you know, kids kind of, I don't know, brag about what happens, you know, remember that guy, and. Well, he's, you know, dead out in the desert, and, you know, they don't believe her. So she decided to take him out there and, and see the guy, and that was kind of the way it went down. The night after Cotton was shot, the next morning, I had gotten up to go to school. Um, I didn't know if this had happened to me or was I just thinking this happened to me. I wasn't really sure, and so... I went back to the scene of the crime, and um, I seen it from the side of the road. <sighs> but it's 
still wasn't real. Teenager Sandy Shaw testified in her own defense today, staring only at her attorney. Shaw explained how last September, she and two older boys drove into the desert with a Canadian man. After the first shot, caught the moon and hit the ground. And there was another shot. And then they uh, get him down, try to get him down. And at the same time that was being said, there was two more shots. What did you do? There was nothing I could do. It was all behind. It was everything was behind me. I was on the ground. It was all behind me. What did you do? I was screaming. At the trial, they told the jury not to uh, allow my um, angelic looks to fool them. That the person I appeared to be was not who I really was. That in fact I was um, a cold-blooded killer. How did that make you feel? At the time, um, I really didn't feel anything. Through that whole time of my life, I really didn't feel nothing. How do you feel guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. And uh, charging you with conspiracy, you commit robbery, conspiracy, you commit murder, robbery, abuse, and the death of weapon, and murder, abuse, and the death of the weapon. How do you plead guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. They offered me a life with the possibility of parole on a plea agreement, and being stubborn and kind of thinking I knew everything at the time, I didn't take it. I thought that 10 to 15 years was the rest of my life at 18 years old. And uh, in reality, it's not. You know, you can start over again. I made a decision when I walked in the game that I was going to come in there as a man and I was going to leave as a man. I wasn't going to resort to things that a lot of people in my situation had to do to survive in prison. I wasn't going to suck dick. I wasn't going to wash people's laundry. I wasn't going to tell on people. I wasn't going to fall into that structure to survive in my environment. I kind of took responsibility at that time that I got myself in the situation, now deal with it. I was fortunate in the sense of some older guys seeing that, that I had a lot of time to do and I stuck up for myself so they kind of put me under their wing on schooling me, on showing me who was who on the yard and what to stay away from, don't get in gambling debts, don't get in any kind of drug debts. You have predators, you have homosexual predators, you have extortionists, and uh, a whole ball of wax, and they're going to test you. One incident, I, I ended up getting uh, shot and stuff like that on the yard and with a guy that was a notorious booty bandit. It was an older guy, a, a, a black guy, I can't even remember his name, homosexual predator. I was 19 and, and this guy was in his late 40s and uh, we were on the yard and it came to either, you know, he says if you want respect you're going to have to come and get some respect. So I had to make sure that that wasn't going to be tolerated. That meant that you, you battled for it. They break it up by, by shooting uh, rounds at you from the waist. It's called skip rounding. I mean, it stopped the fight. It blew me off my feet, you know, because, I mean, you're getting shot by a you know, 12-gauge shotgun from, like, 30 feet away. 
so it it blew me off my feet and you know the fight was over after that. When I arrived at prison, I came, I came to prison for forgery. I forged a $300 check. That's what I was in prison for. I was serving a sentence of a 1 to 15. I wasn't placed in like a minimum security prison for forgers. I was placed in a super maximum security prison for murderers. Eric Daniels was a co-defendant to Troy Kell and in fact uh, was the individual during the homicide that laid across the victim's leg so as to incapacitate the victim from moving. Uh, he, the ironic thing, had been sent to prison uh, on a zero to five, somewhat minimal forgery case, uh, where he had actually taken a check from a local sheriff here, which was his first mistake, and then forged the sheriff's name on his check. Um, not a bright idea. Sent him to prison for zero to five. So Rick Daniels went from a small time crook to never going to see the light of day outside of a prison again. Here I am, a forger, living on death row. I was coming, I was interacting and, and recreating with, with three guys that were that had death sentences that were going to be executed within the next three or four years, and I'm in on prison on forgery. That's how I ended up be, um, becoming involved in violent situations. I felt my only avenue for relief was to lash out against the authority and that's that's how I became involved with the riot. Don't tell me nothing yet. When we got a deal. Until they fucking fulfill their part of the deal, we ain't racking in. Regardless. You feel slighted by the system because you're there in the first place. Okay? And then that builds, okay? And that anger turns into resentment and then absolute bitterness. We want our fucking mail. Sorry guys. I think they're gone. And in Cedar Section 1, return to your cells now or extreme force will be used against you. Return to your cells now and lock up or force will be used against you. They're coming, coming through. They're going to break that door. Yeah, they are. No. The caps are coming off. Hey, they're going to take us over here. Okay, now what? They're gonna do it. Sally Port has been breached. SWAT. Can you guys get out of there? Echo 102. Echo 102. One of the uh, Sally Port section door has been breached. You start to think that the officer that's holding you there, the one that comes and feeds your tray every day, is evil. First thing that comes to most people's minds is lash out, do something violent. Back up, dude. Back up. Get out of that house. Water's off. You're in your cell for so long by yourself, you have no television, no radio, very little contact with the outside world, you develop different symptoms of mental illnesses, paranoid schizophrenic, anxiety disorders, impulsive behaviors, and because you have absolutely nothing to do in there all day long, I plotted and planned on what I was going to do to the administration when I got out of there. I, I threw some urine and some uh, feces on her uh, because I couldn't do anything else to her. I couldn't get my hands on her, and so I, I, that was the next best thing. It made me feel uh, uh, on top of the world to, uh, s to see her running out of the unit, uh, screaming, you know, screaming her head off uh, with feces in her hair and her face.
I got a phone call um, from uh, some official in Utah. Um, I don't remember his name, uh, but I was, you know, they just told me that uh, that my brother had been attacked by another inmate and uh, that he was dead. Uh, and I immediately called my dad and my mom. And, and, you know, you just, just don't want to believe it. You don't want to believe that someone that you Someone that you love is gone. <sighs> this was a, a victim who had a quite storied past in Arkansas, had been in trouble with the law, including armed robbery, uh, had some violent tendencies in Arkansas, and in fact had committed some assaults on guards in Arkansas, committed assaults on inmates in Arkansas. I want to paint a pretty picture of my brother because he was that he was a he was a maximum maximum security risk is what he told me and and I found out after his death that uh, he was in lockdown. Originally, we didn't have any idea why the killing took place. As we got into the case more and more, we did more investigation. One of the more startling aspects of the case was that this was really just some racial hatred. The comments that Troy Kell made at, immediately after the killing. And that he was really quite proud of himself, that, you know, that this black in person would no longer be around, that he couldn't uh, talk about white women, certain comments like that, that he was really, uh, seemed very proud of himself, that there was one less African American on the earth and that that was something good. I would classify myself as a separatist. Uh, that's, I, I believe that, that uh, the white man should return to Europe and should have never came over here. Throughout history, if you see the Greeks or the Romans or, or any civilization that started the Egyptians, that started to intermingle with foreigners, in a sense, outsiders of their racial groups, eventually they've destroyed themselves. Like As we delved into the case, we found out fairly quickly that Troy Kell had very strong beliefs as a white uh, supremacist. The white supremacist group or gang, if you want to call them that, is significant and probably the most significant single group or gang we've got in our prison. Prison has a tendency to, you know, force, force an individual, someone who's impressionable as, as I was, young, to identify with the group. And, um, or, or a certain ideology, and um, I, I found that in, in, in the white separatist movement. And uh, I felt like I belonged, I felt like I climbed a mountain, reached, uh, got to the top, planted the flag, and I was home. It's born out of fear. Uh, fear of uh, knowing another race, uh, keeping your distance from another race. With any kind of white guy that stands up for you know his people he's looked upon as some type of racist race hater and uh, that's not the case in do the majority of the people do you hate Jews? no i can it doesn't concern me at all i mean it maybe people's actions is what i don't like i mean they might choose to do certain things but there's more you know white people that need adjusting than anybody else. In preparation for the case, and primarily the sentencing portion of the case, I went out to Nevada, where of course Troy was housed as a, an inmate for years. During that, the course of that, we actually found a letter 
and it was a letter that Troy Kell had written probably 10 days to two weeks prior to the homicide here in Utah. And he was white, writing some of his white supremacist inmate friends in Nevada. And in that letter he talked about and actually prophesied that he was going to commit this crime in Utah. Talked about how a, uh, a in his terms, a nappy-headed monkey had been running his mouth and this nappy-headed monkey was going to get his and uh, there's going to be pain and suffering involved in that. It was a power trip to begin with, but it had racial overtones to it. it the race issue was used to justify the power trips, controlling the action, wanting to control the TV, the ice bucket, the where this person lived with who, things like that that happen in prison. It becomes racial only, only as a secondary consequence. It starts off from greed and, and uh, profit and control, like anything else. I had a confrontation with him verbally that derived from two other people's fight. It kind of, you know, flowed over to me getting involved with, with him. And it was uh, kind of agreed uh, between me and him that, that we were going to take care of it. You know, that any chance that either one of us got, that we were going to deal with the situation. I prepared, I got a, a knife and I got a, a handcuff key. And we were restrained, we were going down to medical. They forged his name, requesting that he, that my brother go to the infirmary. I filled out what they call a medical request slip four black men to get him out of his cell on a particular day. The guard came to my brother's cell and said, hey, you ready to go? And my brother what do you mean? Ready to go where? They came over my intercom in my cell and said, uh, Daniels, uh, you know, you're going to medical today. And uh, I knew, I knew, you know, I knew it was the day. He was sporting his colors, you know, flying his bandana. When he got to the infirmary, Troy Kell and Eric Daniels and another inmate were there also. The next thing I know, um, black men's running towards me. And it was on. He's trying to stab him, stab him in the back. I knew that it was, it was a strong hit because of the color of the blood and it's dark and that that's a sign that where you got an artery or a vein or something like that. You need to fly down here, full gear. Steven. Video officer, go ahead, come back again. Steven. Where's Johnny? Yeah. I want him to. Yeah. Take the medical. Come on, full gear in season three now. Section three here. Rack in, everybody! Rack in, everybody! Rack in, rack in, rack in! Why did you stab him so many times? All I can explain really is that he kept moving. I just stabbed the shit out of him, you know, until he didn't move anymore. And I ended up stabbing the man to death. The shank went into 10. Afterwards, I felt, man, goddamn, why'd, why'd you kind of make me do that? Or I didn't weigh in the fact that he was a father or a brother or a son to, to anybody. You know, I didn't see him as a human person. The prison guards saw this happening. There were civilians there. The guard ushers them out. They then go and get into full riot gear. My brother's still being stabbed. come in and then they 
grabbed Kel and this other guy. When my brother's dying by then, it's it's just too much time has elapsed. I will tell you that I've never seen anything like that in my life. I got more and more horrified the more I watched it, as I had to watch it over and over again to prepare for the case. I actually to the point where we had to count the number of stab wounds. After watching the videotape, initially, I, several nights, I had problems sleeping. From a prosecutor's standpoint, the, to have a videotape of the crime is kind of unheard of. My father and I went to Utah for one reason, one reason only, and that was to try to make a change. We wanted to talk to the prison officials. We wanted someone to tell us that they were going to change the procedures. That's why we went, to ensure that what happened to my brother didn't happen to another inmate. Troy Cal did take the stand. He was very articulate, very intelligent and was able to bring up emotion which at the time appeared to be genuine and in fact he addressed the victim's family who happened to be in the audience from Arkansas from the witness stand he asked if uh, after he finished testifying if he could talk to me and my dad one-on-one -on -one and sit down <laughs> and he said uh, sit down as men as men and talk told them how sorry he was that he had, he had killed their son, their brother, and he, and he actually uh, was crying at the time, which uh, I've got to say, as a prosecutor, it was one of the more re remarkable events I had seen from a defendant testifying on the stand. There were like, I think, eight women on the jury and four men, and uh, I, I kind of looked over it when he was testifying, and some of the women were crying. Fortunately for us, uh, before Troy Kell had taken the stand to testify, he had told two of the guards that were transporting him to and from the courtroom, watch this, I'm going to win an Academy Award. In other words, he was going to get on the witness stand and just lie. Yeah, I was fighting for my life. I did what I had to do to try to save my life. But I, I didn't, the emotional part of it was genuine to his family. Because the way I live my life, eventually somebody, if the state doesn't kill me, eventually someone will, will get me, you know, because of the way I live my life. It's just a part of it. Uh, and, and my family accepts that. But, and I accept that. But the thing is, is I would want somebody to show my father the respect that uh, that I think he's got coming. You know, that's that's all I can really say about that. So, if I understand you right, you're saying that you meant what you said to that father. That that wasn't an act. That wasn't fake. No, I meant I meant what I said to him. I mean, they want to downplay it because they're fighting to win the case. Uh, I put the guards back on the stand, and the guards ended up testifying as to this conversation they had had with Troy Kell about winning an Academy Award. I was subpoenaed to testify at that trial, although I wish he would have done things a lot differently. I don't know if I can... Um, I can't pass judgment upon him 
for the things he's done. I don't agree with the things he's done. I don't like the things he has done. Um, but I cannot judge him for the things he has done because I don't live like he lives and I don't walk in his shoes and I don't feel what he feels. If society has once sentenced him, convicted him to life without possibility of parole for a murder, and he's chosen then in a very brutal fashion to take another life while incarcerated, what other option is available? And realistically, the chance that Troy Kell in the future could commit another homicide while in prison. And I think that was probably the most weighty thing uh, that ended up in the jurors voting for the death penalty. I don't think the death penalty works. Uh, uh, you know, there are people who's on death row, and, uh, you know, we just had recently had some... Um, McVeigh was put to death. Uh, does, does that stop terrorism? I don't think it will. Does it stop people from murdering and killing and raping? I don't think it will. It, you know, some of my coworkers say, hey, well, he won't do it again. Well, sure, but that doesn't deter others. There's, there's no, no punishment on this earth that, that's uh, going to even come close to what Kel will face when he, when he meets God. That's my personal belief. Uh, you can kill him 20 times over and it won't even come close to what he will suffer in the face of God. heaven and hell thing. It's a control mechanism to control the masses. And it's run by fear. And I don't believe in any fiery pits or any pie in the sky. Uh, I think once you're dead, you're dead. On the second time you do this line, that's when the whole band comes in. All right, let's try it. No, no, no. I came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and that happened almost three years ago. The way I look at people, my relationships with fellow, my fellow man and woman, um, have just changed dramatically. I no longer um, see people in terms of skin color. I am considered to be a race traitor in their eyes. Uh, and so even the things that I'm saying to you right now are things that, you know, I could be retaliated against for. Well, I'm happy for him. And I hope that uh, he can turn his life around. I'm sorry for fucking his life off. Mm -hmm. Troy, Troy would be, in a, on a spectrum, he would be the extremist. Um, I honestly believe that uh, if Troy was to ever get out of prison, he'd be, you know, blowing up buildings and stuff. I mean, there, you know. You mean like a Tim McVeigh or a militia movement? Yeah, or... yeah. And, that... I, and I probably would have, too, to be honest with you, if I'd have gotten out of prison. I, that's the self-destructive path that I was on. Uh, the eighth letter of the alphabet is H. H H stands for Heil Hitler. White supremacists believe that Jews are the ultimate enemy, that they pit black and white against each other so that, that we both eliminate each other in order that they ultimately win. 
And that's the whole philosophy in a nutshell. Yeah, the banks, the media, uh, you know, uh, they, they subliminally uh, inject thoughts and opinions into uh, people's minds, and those opinions are all uh, favorable for the Jewish uh, agenda and all that nonsense. And the thing is, it, I, I see it now as nonsense, but I'm, I'm telling you, I bought into it. I, I think that there's some merit to that. If you look at it, the people that are calling the shots, and I think it's definitely not coincidental. I mean, they look out for their own. I mean, they've been through some hard damn times in the history of the world, and they got, they're entitled to, to do that, and it's a power trip. That's it's all it is. It's a structure. Do you believe the Holocaust happened, or do you believe these revisionists well, yeah. who said it never happened? It's just uh, a bad rap on the Third Reich. Uh, to the magnitude that they say, uh, no, because there's no mention. It's only the the numbers don't match up to the to the claim of of what they're saying of the Holocaust. Yes, I believe it happened. There was a war going on, and he told them what they were going to do, what he was going to do. Ten years before he even started doing it, it's uh, you know seek and destroy. It's that's the way it was conquest. That's what was happening. I mean, it, it was. That's just the way it went. I mean, that's how uh, nations were built. Was by force. I deserve the death sentence. You know, I didn't get the death sentence. Um, again, I believe that God intervened in my life, or at least in two jurors' minds, and I didn't receive the death sentence. I deserved it, and I got mercy. And um, Troy didn't. I've only been here for one execution, and it happened to be the firing squad. And to me, it seemed a cleaner, uh, faster way to go. Uh, the man didn't experience any kind of uh, because they think it's like a medical thing. I, I got a problem with the way I don't have a problem with the death penalty. Okay, it's in, in the sense of of that's the penalty. Uh, but when they try to, you know, make it like a medical procedure. Uh, like they're going into like an operation or something like that. I, you know, show it for what it is. You know, you're killing a guy. Regardless of, of the justification, we can all justify our actions in one form or another. The fact is, you're killing a guy. So show it for what it is. That's what it is. I think they should take it down to the Delta Center and, and show the public w what exactly is going on. When he first entered the system, he was 18 years old. He was a handsome man. He was an intelligent man. Um, and I remember him telling me, I'm entering as a man and I'm going to remain a man. And I believe he's done that. I still wake up to this day and just, I cannot believe I'm here. That this is what my life has amounted to. I have spent over half my life in prison, my adult life has been in prison, you know? And it's just really hard. And sometimes I wonder, you know, will I ever get a driver's license, you know? Will I ever um, get to go buy furniture for, you know, a house? Am I ever gonna, you know? Click on mouse invaders and click OK. I hope and I pray that one day, um, I will be given a second chance. I was an unhealthy child. I was a lost child. How much longer do you expect to be alive? I don't, I don't know. I can't see, I can't even answer that question. No, I can't even answer that question. I don't know. I really don't know. I hope, I hope a long time, but... 
I, I go through that all the time. So I don't know. You go through what all the time? I go through with making the decision of, you know, the, living through this shit or, or not. Because I fucked my life off. So, I mean, I've been pissed off since I've been 18 years old. <laughs> 